you very much, everyone, for being here. I presume that most of you are thinking about the launch, but uh, brought me your attention for 50 minutes. I believe that you will really enjoy this short interview with Lauren Chong, which is the author of the Creative Change book recently launched. And I will say a few words to introduce you because most of the people here had the chance to listen to you yesterday we, during our first session. But uh, Lawrence uh, leads a global movement of change maker through Consuls, which is a creative company, um, creative change company operating in more than 23 nations. Consuls in a aims to enable change makers to shape an equitable economy, also known as the economy of communion. Uh, he has uh, to take to uh, talks and on creativity and change, and is um, followed uh, worldwide in LinkedIn and other social media. But in 2021, he, as a result of his long-term standing work in, in the religious dialogue, he was appointed but the Pope Francis to serve as a consultant for the Office of Interreligious Dialogue. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to have you Thanks, here. Maya. I would like to start with this H coaching cover. We can see here a lion, some butterflies, a cathedral, a mountain, and some circular movement at the beginning, uh, oh, sorry, uh, at the top of the cover. Could you please explain a little bit about the symbols and which mean in terms of the book? Yeah, thanks, Maria. I think there was one conversation I had with a friend uh, who is a professor in Quebec, and he told me this very interesting statistic that most of the PhD papers in the world are never used. Only 1% of known knowledge is applied to change. And when I did the TED Talk, uh, I understood that there are more than 100,000 talks given, but the acceptance and the application of these ideas to mainstream them, to realize them, is actually less than 5%. And there's a very interesting statistic that we live in the world of the internet because people assume they can always Google it, they don't remember it. So, so one of the things I attempted to do was to make sure that they are memorable, and I wrote them in six parables. So when you see the image of the lion, apparently lions don't hunt very well. They rely a lot on observation before they decide when to hunt. And, and I, I, I start off with that premise of seeing because most change makers die easy. <laughs> so it's very important to know that you will die easy as a change maker and you need to actually trust and to observe well before you, you, you go for you know, the strike of, of the cause that you believe in. And, so those parables about finding your own Everest, because my own struggle as a change maker, because I, when I was um, young, I grew up in the society like Singapore that always talks about money, money, money. It's not about change. And when I came to Rome as part of a big international uh, movement of young people who believe in the crazy ass idea of the United World, um, and this lady, her name is Kiara Lubick, a UNESCO Peace Prize winner, when she spoke about the United World, I said, this is my life because this is what I want to do. And I found my Everest because the idea of a United World is an impossible dream. And I realized as I did the research on my book, whether you go to Mahatma Gandhi, whether you go to different figures in politics, religion, uh, non-profit, civil society, they all went for the impossible dream. And so, the, the, the parables are all designed around, um, it's, it's like a walking a long journey that if you're already a change maker, you will understand that your impossible dream is actually possible because you see it, you gun for it, and there will, if your cause is true, there will be people who will come along. Yeah, that's, that's why I write it like this because people don't remember. So I try to make it as memorable as possible. The six parables and as a way, of a, as a journey project for change makers. 
Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. I and mean, I would like to follow with a question uh, that because in the very beginning of your book, more precisely in the introduction, you said that this book is not for personal improvement, not for wealth accumulation. So why did you write your book and to whom it is addressed? Well, interestingly, you know, as a consultant um, and running a global consulting practice, writing a book is a norm. I wrote my first book 10 years ago because I was invited by Dr. Philip Kotler at the World Marketing Summit. And, and Dr. Philip had this, Professor Philip had this vision that marketing can change the world. So I thought I should write my book. But when I finished that book, I said, who the hell is going to read this? <laughs> so I threw the whole draft away until COVID came. A group of young people in Singapore, I do not know them, they researched on me and said, Lawrence, we want to hear you speak. And I benefited from change makers when I was a youth and said, if, I'm, if they ask me to speak, I've got to give them something of meaning. I decided to share about my life. I didn't become a priest. I believe in changing the world through the economy. I want to challenge management consulting because manage, the largest management consulting companies in the world believe in maximization of profit not consulting as a force for change. And that's what we are going after, right? That's our core of our mission. So when I gave that talk in TEDx, a few of the youth, they said to me, Lawrence, what you shared helped me. And this is, I believe in what you said. So that's, that's one. Okay, I think there's something is happening. Three months after that, a group of young Indian, uh, it's a prominent Indian school, overseas Indian in Singapore, they said, look, we researched about you. We want you to share something to our uh, um, you know, Indian, global Indian school and to share your, your life. And I did that. And again, I said, if I'm going to share something, I'm going to share about how change making, not as a theory, but changed my life. Because I came from a society that's about money, money, money. And I went from that to, build, to finding that you can live a life as a change maker. So when I shared that, and again, the same reaction because the youth wouldn't stop asking questions. Because most young people believe that inevitability of things, that change is not possible. And when they heard and they say that, look, are you saying that we can unpack this? We can change the system? We can do it? I said, yes, you can. Because I'm not born from a rich family. I don't have patrons. And I'm now in five continents, 23 nations. But simply because my friends from all around the way, they said, we believe in this vision that you believe in and we want to be part of it, right? So because of that, I wrote the book. So I wrote this book for young people. I also wrote the book for my peers in the 40s because my friends in the 40s, they said, you know, I'm past that age. I can't do it anymore. And I said, you know what, Mahatma Gandhi and all these people, they were not young. They were already, you know, at their late 30s, 40s and they went for change. And I know so many intergenerational change makers. I know a change maker who is in his 60s and 70s. They are trying to bring about inclusive economy at their age. They have worked in multinationals and they're going as change makers. So I wrote it for anyone who feels alone. I wrote it for anyone who feels that change is not possible. I wrote it for anyone who feels that I need, I need to read something that people have struggled uh, dealing with the difficulties that I can, I can know that I'm not alone. So if, it's like X-Men, right? If you're a change picker out there, this book for you, right? So, I, yeah, that's the thing. Very inspirational. Yeah. Um, and um, going to the title of this forum, which is the role of ethics in your book and in being a change maker? Yeah, that's a very important question. I gave a speech in Abuja and I said to my friends in Nigeria, evil is more intentional than good. I learned this in interreligious dialogue. There is more funding and extremism, almost 100 to 1. If you try to raise money for interreligious dialogue, it's worse than raising money for poverty alleviation. No one wants to talk to you. No one wants to care about interreligious dialogue. When I was in Religions for Peace, the budget is a joke <laughs> because it's the budget of a parish church because you can't raise that kind of money. So when you are dealing with this kind of construct, um, what I really wanted to do was to, based on my own experience, to understand that there has to be a very strategic view. Uh, that's why I broke it down to the four Cs. First, you must be clear about your cause, and you need to find feedback for your cause. If your cause is true, 
you will naturally be able to come up with a creative vision. And creativity is actually so, uh, it's, a, it's a common trait in all the, all the change makers. Whether you go to um, or what Leonardo da Vinci, he was a misfit, he's born out of wedlock, uh, he's not considered a member of his society, he's not welcome, and he managed to see a different world, right? So you come from that perspective of creative vision, and how do you know your creative vision is true? You do not need thousands, you just need a few. And all the change makers in the world attracted two, three, ten, twelve maximum. And that core group, the circle of trust, together with the founders or the people who are inspired by these causes, they build the movement. So in this day and age where there's so much inevitability, where big money tells you this is how the world is, in terms of artificial intelligence, we're dealing with big money. It is still possible to creatively see a different world. And one thing in common, and I learned this from the founding father of Singapore, there was a video of him talking to a group of businessmen in a smelly, dirty Singapore. If you came to Singapore in the 1960s, you were faint if you smell Singapore River. Right? And he said at this hotel next to the Singapore River, one day, a metropolis shall rise. He saw it, and all the change makers in common. Muhammad Gandhi saw a new India, and a new India is possible before the British were to give him permission. He didn't ask for permission from the British. He saw that an independent India is possible. So that's, that's one thing we, get, we need to get it straight. You will never gain acceptance if you start to if you start with change. You'll always be the misfit. You'll always be the person who is the outsider, right? And so... The, the notion of creative change is what I wanted to do to respect the many change makers I've studied. They didn't ask for permission, but they saw a different world and they changed it creatively. Wow. <laughs> yeah. A big clap. And I would like to make another question regarding yeah. the trust, yeah. because it's a concept that we have heard during the conference. And, but what mean trust in, in your book? And why should one trust in today's world? Yeah, you know, um, during COVID, it was quite kind of interesting uh, as someone and, and my colleagues, uh, you know, some of them are here and, and around the world. We noticed that trust is not a systemic thing. If you have a lack of trust, it's, it's a consequence that the system is failing. And you, you must be very specific. Why did it fail in the first place? It failed because your core group of leaders no longer have a shared interest. When, you call, when your core set of leaders start to contradict one another and they don't have a shared ethos of a nation, of a religion, of an organization, that is the beginning of the end. That is when you see the downfall of trust. So the, the issue is that we have increasingly cohorts of leaders who don't share the same principles of trust. So I think one of the, you know, the professors was asking who's ethics, right? I think, I think because we have different operating system of trust among leaders, even if they are in the same country, even if the same religion, and even if they're same company, that is our biggest challenge. So it's not system. The system is failing because of this. So we have competing operating system, trust systems. And, and that's why this conference is so important. That's why what Fadi and all of you are doing is so important. We need a more honest and principled discussion on the operating system of trust, but it starts from core leaders. Yeah? And then the ethics comes as, as a consequence of understanding that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and for this beautiful creation. Uh, I presume that you, the people can acquire it uh, at the entrance of yes, the auditorium. There. And thank you one more time for discussing your, your book. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.